Hello again, this is Earl Silgren, Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Rheumatology, welcome you back as I highlight a paper of particular interest to the readership of the journal by interviewing the authors of an article from the October 2022 edition of the journal. Article I have picked today for more in-depth exposure is entitled, Long-Term Behavioral Changes During the COVID-19 Pandemic and Impact of Vaccination in Patients with Inflammatory Rheumatic Disease by Bentag, Glintberg and colleagues. And today I am pleased to talk, to be speaking with Drs. Bente Glintberg, uh, Glintberg and Dr. Maretta Hetland about anxiety and self-isolation and attitudes towards vaccination during the COVID-19 pandemic in patients with inflammatory rheumatic diseases. And I wanna thank you both for taking the time to speak to me and our listeners. So with that, let's begin. Um, could you please describe to us what led you to perform the study? Thank you very much for the invitation and uh, thank you for this very relevant question. So what happened during the pandemic, as you all know, is that we could not see the patients in the clinic as we usually did. We couldn't make this physical consultations due to nationwide lockdowns. It actually happened from one day to the other. So we find it of high relevance to understand what this lockdown period meant for our patients. And actually in the beginning, we were mostly worried about medication on compliance, that the patients were to be stopping their immunosuppressant therapy due to fear of COVID-19 infection. There was a lot of debate about that in the beginning of the pandemic. Now it's more than two years ago, but still. So, but actually what we learned and um, is that it was not this medication non-compliance that was an issue to the patient. It was more being anxious and self-isolating due to fear of having COVID-19 infections. So that seemed to have a major impact of our patients. So that's what we find of interest to perform multiple surveys in these patients, uh, in the Danish population of arthritis patients to understand how the ongoing pandemic affected their tendency to self-isolate and if their anxiety changed during the pandemic phases where you had lockdowns and opening and lockdowns again. And also I could perhaps also add that actually in Denmark, we had quite a good infrastructure for following our patients with arthritis. We have a nationwide registry called DanBio. It has more than now 20 years of backwards history. So, and, and also we have quite good coverage. So. We think that more than 90, 95% of the patients are prospectively followed in DanBio. So that gives us a very good uh, source or infrastructure for contacting and following patients. And also we have an electronic system called eBox where we can forward invitations and communications to the patients that we want to uh, contact. So we have also some Danish fortunate situations to um, monitor and contact the patients. Right, anything you wanna add? Yeah, just to add what, uh, what Bendy just said, I also want to thank you for this uh, possibility to share some thoughts about our study. And uh, I think that one aspect of this was also that because we use DanBio in our routine clinical care, when we suddenly were in a situation where we only had the patients largely on phone, um, we sort of, we got worried that we sort of lost the track of how they were actually doing so we wanted to uh, also set up a system where we could then on a distance get their input, their patient reported outcomes. So, so this was sort of a co-aim that we both wanted to know about this COVID aspect, but we also actually wanted to monitor the patients in routine care also when we didn't see them face to face. So I think you asked one of the questions I didn't ask you, give you in advance. It was mainly uh, telephone because certainly in some countries in, in my province, we could do either telephone or telehealth. So we could use video. I don't know, did you have that during the pandemic? No, well, I, th I think there's, I think what we call pandemic, it has now, yeah, is it in pandemic now? But in the beginning of the pandemic, we switched the close down for nearly everything but the acute contacts and that was by telephone Wait and then i think we tried to implement video consultations but it proved to be actually quite difficult but it could 
it could vary across Denmark, but it's in the region where Marita and I are, are located in the, the Copenhagen um, main area. It turned out that it was quite difficult to set up the infrastructure. Also, the patients were required to have good video skills and technical skills. And it was quite an, an effort to get it up and running because we haven't used that strategy before. So it mainly was telephone. But, but I think it was luck, lockdown and then opening. So in the beginning, mm. no physical contacts. But then, of course, during the coming months after the initial lockdown, we started reopening gradually and then also fully uh, for some phases. So it changed quite a lot. But no, we have no routine access to video, at least as far as we know. But it could, it could be affected by the area you live in Denmark. No, it was not a main thing. It was just my curiosity yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. how different yeah, yeah. countries, yeah, whether yeah. they had the video access. Anyway, we'll move back to the study. So I think you went over some of this of who was studied, the time period. Um, we didn't really address, and you obviously did address how you identified them. And approximately what percentage of patients who were sent the survey responded? Yeah. Exactly. So we, we uh, sent out the first survey in June 2020. We had the lockdown in, on March 11th, 2020, and it took us a couple of months to actually get the infrastructure ready for, for starting capturing data. So the survey was uh, sent out in June 2020. And then because the pandemic continued, we also wanted to follow up. So we sent a second survey in November of 2020, so that is nearly two years ago from now, and then a third survey in May 21. Actually, we thought by May 21 that now it's over. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which it wasn't, but it was sort of a more optimistic period of time where we had the vaccine there and people were sort of beginning to hope for a normalization of their lives. Um, so this was sent to all the Danes or all the, all the patients we have in Danbio with inflammatory arthritis who have access to this e-box, which is a public system. It is the Danish authorities that communicate with all uh, inhabitants through this e-box system. But then if you are without computer skills, you can actually get an exception, an exception and you don't use the system. So we couldn't send to all our patients, but to nearly all the patients. So we sent to 36,000 patients each survey. Um, and uh, each time, approximately one third of the patients actually responded, which we found was an, a, an amazingly high percentage that they found the time and energy to do this in a period of a crisis. Um, and, uh, and we were extremely happy to get that kind of response rates because this was, as I said, simultaneously with the survey, this was also an implementation of what we call the Dan Bio from home, that the patients could actually fill in the, the uh, PROs at home. We could capture it in our system and see how the patient was doing, even though we didn't actually uh, have them uh, face to face. Yeah. Um, so I think was that I think that was my yeah, first yeah, yeah. Anything you yeah. want to add? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, we could say that I think it was approximately five thousand patients that actually answered all three surveys, and we could say that each survey was more than a hundred questions about your behavior and tendency to self-isolate. So we have very patient patients that are willing mm -hmm. to answer quite a lot of questions. And I think we said that it was more. It, it's in the paper. It's more than 20,000 patients that answered at least one of the questionnaires. That's impressive, so, it really is. I guess the one good thing about the lockdowns, you had time. <laughs> People had time yeah. to answer the yeah. question mm. and get some of their boredom. But that's excellent, an excellent response rate. So it really will make our readers confident in the findings. Mm. Um, Could I just add one thing, mm -hmm. just to say that um, we say you ask about the what kind of patient groups we yeah. we included patients that were uh, routinely monitored in Denver. That's mainly patients with rheumatoid arthritis and axonal arthritis and thoracic arthritis. And approximately 60-64% of the patients had rheumatoid arthritis. 
and then remaining were half divided with psoriatic arthritis and axial spondylitis. arthritis. So those were the patient groups that contributed to the, to the questionnaire surveys. Right. right. Yeah. Thank you. So we'll move on to the next uh, What were the major findings of the study that you'd like to share? Uh, I think, oh, is it, oh, I thought it was human related, but that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it was of interest to us to understand these levels of, uh, especially anxiety and the tendency to self-isolate. We had different phrasing of these questions, for instance, do you attempt to self-isolate more than persons your own age? And what we saw that it was up to nearly 50% of the patients that had anxiety and reported tendency to self-isolate. And what surprised us a little bit was that it tended to be, it was of course highest in the beginning uh, during or immediately after the lockdown period in June uh, 2020, but also during the period when we had the vaccinations, those levels of self-reported anxiety seemed to be quite high. And then uh, we of course, we did not have a control group. We only had rheumatoid patients in the survey, but what we did was then to compare within uh, the arthritis patients to understand if some characteristics of the patients uh, affected these um, tendencies to self-isolate or report it. And we saw that especially women and the patients that were treated by, with biologicals and the patients that had um, poor self-reported health were the ones that tended to self-isolate the most. Um, yeah, so I think those were a little bit of a surprise and also uh, of interest is perhaps to say that we performed the survey when the vaccines were coming out uh, they were introduced on the market and in the beginning there was some scarceness there were not vaccines for everybody but we saw very very high acceptance rates the patients that were offered uh, it depended on age the elderly were offered the vaccines first they nearly all accepted to to get the vaccine so we didn't report any high levels of skepticism towards the vaccines of the COVID. And also we asked the patient, what about influenza vaccines? It's well known that our patients should. Uh, it's a good advice to take the influenza vaccines. And we can also see that the tendency to accept the vaccination for influenza also increased in uh, 2021 compared to 2020 before the pandemic started. Anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I was just thinking that that this our findings with high self isolation and sort of anxious strategies, I think, was very much also reflected in our clinical experience with the patients, where we, for the first many months, it was surprising to hear from all patients that no, they hadn't um, they hadn't contracted the infection, uh, and and then we under we began to understand when we saw how they isolated themselves, so they actually. They didn't go out, they didn't go shopping, they didn't use public transportation. They just stayed at home and sort of got everything delivered by the door. And then of course you don't contract the virus, but you suffer from feeling lonely and being depressed and don't getting your exercise, et cetera, et cetera. So it has had a huge impact uh, on our patients with arthritis uh, that we've had this pandemic. And we were quite surprised to see how this behavior somehow stuck with the patients, even at a time where we had the vaccination and where we had new variants that were much less um, contagious, or they were more contagious, but they were less severe than the initial versions. So, 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 so we think that is a surprising and important finding. Yeah, I found it fascinating that, mm -hmm. but I guess in many ways, not surprising that the vaccine didn't really alter the anxiety and behaviors. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're anxious and you're worried because you have a chronic illness, it appears to be that across the illnesses, that that's what we're seeing. Mm -hmm. And just one thing, just for the audience again, um, Denmark had the mRNA vaccine. Was that most of patients? Yes, yes, the yes, MRNA? yes. We had, I think 90% of patients got the Pfizer vaccine and the last 10% right. got the... Um, Moderna. Moderna. Yeah, the Moderna, yes. Yeah, yeah. Was, and again, just as in Canada, the AstraZeneca, you almost didn't use it all, correct? Mm, yeah, that's true. Okay. Yeah. So my final question, almost my final question, what do you think we can learn from the study 
as we deal with what we think I call the pandemic, but it might very well be like influenza becoming an endemic virus. What do you think your study can teach us of how to help our patients? Hmm. Would you start, Linda? Yeah, well, I think it's important to be aware that uh, our patient group, or at least some of the patients, seem to be uh, worried. Uh, they fear having severe infections. They are getting immunosuppressants. They have high compliance to the treatment. They understand the importance of the treatments they get, but they are quite anxious to get severe um, infection due to their treatment. So I think it's important to be aware that this seems to be something that has come to stay or well, we, I think the last survey was from last year. So we, we have not any data from this year and also we have no pre-pandemic recording. Um, so we cannot really level uh, compared to what was the mental status of our patients before the pandemic came. But I think it's a surprise to us to see that these quite, quite high levels or proportions of patients reported being anxious and tended to self-isolate due to fear of infection. Mm. And also I think it's, it's of interest for us to understand so willing the patients are to report um, their emotions and uh, behavior in such a situation. I think it's impressive that thousands of patients answer so many que questions for us to understand what's going on. I think that's, um, yeah, that's of interest and a positive uh, insight, of course. Anything you wanna add, Martha? Um, I think what, what we could add is that this Dan Bio from home was uh, very successfully implemented on top of, of this or uh, along with the, uh, with the surveys. So that uh, today it's about three quarters of the patients who actually prefer to use the, the, um, their phone to do the responses to the PROs rather than the touch screen in the waiting room. And I think it is because using your phone gives you the ability to do it at home where you are in private. Whereas when you are sitting at a screen in a waiting room, there's always some kind of both a, pri a privacy issue and now with the pandemic and infections, people are also more sensitive to, well, is this screen clean or not? Can I touch it safely? Um, so, so we are quite happy that we managed to actually teach the patients to use this system also in the routine care, even also now when we see them face to face again. Yeah, it'd be interesting that I know some people advocate how important the pros are and maybe if you have that in advance, they do it in advance, it might help the visit and yes. focus your visit onto something. It's fascinating yes. how we actually can improve care, I think, yes. from what we've learned in the pandemic. We hope. Yes. And we can even say that actually in Denmark, we have collected the pros systematically for more than 20 years. So it is actually for us, it is a continuation of what we have been doing for almost right. a generation. Um, but it suddenly, it got a new angle to it or a new perspective when we also got the, the pandemic on top. Right. Mm. So my last question, is there anything else that we missed that you think is important for the listeners to, to know about? Don't feel mm -hmm. pressure. <laughs> No, I think actually we have all on our list. I can't think of anything else, actually. No, I also think that we, we have covered many topics, both regarding the COVID pandemic and also regarding this collection of PROs in routine care, also in a pandemic. So, so thank you so much for the interest in our study. Well, thank you both. It was an excellent study. I think we can... I think hopefully everybody will read it. I certainly learned from it and I think it will help care with our patients. And I really do wanna thank you for taking the time to speak to me and give our listeners some new insights into what happens during the pandemic. And to our viewers, please read the manuscript entitled Long-Term Behavioral Changes During the COVID-19 Pandemic and the Impact of Vaccination in Patients with Inflammatory Rheumatic Diseases by Dr. Bente Glintberg and colleagues. And this is now available at the journal's website at jroom.org. And we'd love to hear from you, your comments on Twitter at jroom or by email at manuscripts at jroom.org.
www.ghanaspeaks.com. And I want to thank you all for joining and hope next week, you will, uh, next month, you'll come, you'll again listen as I speak to the author of one of the articles of particular interest in the November 2022 edition. Thank you. Thank you.